Hey guys, Solid here and welcome back to the garage. It's time for a Q&A, so grab your cup of tea, maybe a cup of coffee or even a whiskey if it's been that kind of week. So let's get into those comments and roll the intro. So one big thing to announce before we get into the questions is myself and my wife have just bought our very first house. So we're very excited, but also very stressed out at the moment. Just wanted to share my excitement. I'm apologizing in advance if I'm not as responsive as I usually am. So the second thing is I'm thinking of doing my monthly adventure news once again, just to wrap up each month, all the things that are going on in the off-road world. If you wanna see that, let me know in the comment section below. The third thing is I've just done some little modifications lately. I've chucked on the double take mirrors. I've gone for the Mickey Mouse ones, purely because most people choose the adventure ones, which look a little bit sharper. And like I always say, I like to stand out, even if it is looking a bit odd. I look a bit odd, so the bike suits me just fine as it is. And I'm really liking them. I haven't tested them off-road yet, so I can't really tell you about durability and functionality yet, but I do like them just riding around on the street. They're plenty good for visibility so far. The other thing I'm planning on doing is wiring up a USB charger onto the bike. I'm actually gonna run it directly off the power source of the motorcycle, which is behind the headlight. I believe there's a spare power outlet just in there. I will show that in a future video, but I thought I'd do it properly this time and get my mate over to help me solder things up and uh, make an SAE connection so I can quick disconnect it and all that good stuff. So looking forward to doing that. I've also found some protective tape at Bunnings. Usually you get charged an arm and a leg online for protective tape for your swing arm and for your frame for motorcycles. And it's really expensive for a sheet like that. And sometimes I see it for like 30 bucks. A friend has put me on to this stuff, New Browts, who also has a YouTube channel. So check him out if you haven't already but he's put me onto this tape at Bunnings which is about half the price and does just as good a job so I'm looking forward to covering my bike in protective clear tape especially over my frame as my MX boots always wear away the paint on my frame so that's been something that's been worrying me especially with this shiny new bike behind me got a question here from Tama616 saying, hey Solid, how you doing mate? Love the concept and content of this channel, superb. Thank you for the compliment. I'm a long time scooter rider and considering the transition to a dual sport for a while now. Possibly you can advise, how would a CRF 300L fit me? I'm 1.87 meters tall and 88 kilos. A bit concerned about my weight plus the famous suspension. Well, fit wise, I think you'll be fine. Taller bars, maybe a taller seat as well once Seat Concepts comes out with something because I have noticed I'm kind of at the maximum height where it would be comfortable between the height of the pegs and the way my legs bend. If I was any taller, I think I'd start to feel a bit cramped, but that's something that I'm sure will be solved quite soon in the future. So I think fit, you will be fine. Your weight, I don't think you got too much to worry about. Yes, the suspension is soft, but if you're looking for something just to sort you out in the short term while you do figure out what you wanna do with upgrades with suspension, just bump up the preload on the suspension on the rear of this motorcycle to cope with your extra weight. I don't think it'll be too much of a problem. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised coming from a scooter. There's an awful lot of travel in this bike. So although the suspension is very soft, there's so much travel in it that you very rarely experience bottoming it out unless you start doing jumps or really extreme whoops. If you're doing that kind of stuff, then yes, I would recommend getting suspension. If you're not, and you're just dipping your toes into off-road for the first time, or you just want a dual sport, then this is gonna be fine for six months. It might even be fine for the rest of the time you have the motorcycle. The next question is from John, and it's quite an interesting question. What equipment do I use for shooting all my videos? Video-wise, everything I use, I put down in the descriptions of my videos, mate. So you can click through and find everything there that I use. The main things I use is what I'm talking to you now with is a Sony ZV-1. That's what I do most of my face-to-face -face stuff with. I also use the Rode Wireless Goes that I'm talking to you with, the lav mic. I do use a Canon M50 for a lot of B-roll stuff, as well as when I'm out riding on the motorcycle, that's a bit cheaper of a camera, and I won't be so sad if I break that. The ZV-1's quite expensive, so I'm very precious about it. 
basically tripods. I do use a couple of key lights in the other room where I do my new stuff. I do have two focus lights, big key light. Um, it's a Godox SL150 from memory. So that's the basic stuff. I would say concentrate on audio first if your budget is quite tight as audio is the most important. Then concentrate on video quality from there. And if you're really tight for stuff, phones are so good these days that you really could get by. If you've got a fairly modern iPhone or Samsung Galaxy, you really can do a lot with them, especially if you fitted proper audio to it as well. I also use a shotgun mic when I'm out on the bike, when I'm doing a talking to the camera on the Canon M50. It's a Rode Micro shotgun mic. That's pretty fantastic, very compact, but the audio is great. On my helmet, I'm using a GoPro Hero 9 Black at the moment. I'm not entirely convinced it's the greatest action camera of all time. It definitely has fantastic image quality if you get the settings right. I'm not going to go into that. And then I just have a Sony ECM. Uh, it's a cheap $30 lavalier mic. I do the really important reflective stuff in the studio with a, a blue snowball, I think it is. It's not too expensive. There's lots of better stuff out now. I got that ages ago but that's how I generally do everything. It is a lot. And then the editing software I use is DaVinci Resolve. Josh Campbell was saying they should make a WR250R built for MX. They kind of do already. There's the YZ250 and there's also the WR250F, which here in Australia comes with a license plate. So if you're wanting to get more hardcore, we have that bike straight out of the gate, road legal. But I do kind of get what you're trying to suggest if this is indeed what you're aiming for in that you want a WR250R motor, the reliability, the long service intervals, the dependability, that big alternator, all the great things that we love the little wizard for, but bolted to fantastic suspension and fantastic components to really bump it up into a really durable and long lasting low powered enduro bike. That I have been going on about forever. I think some manufacturers should do that, whether it's KTM, Honda, Yamaha, I do not care. I just wish someone would do that already. Benito AM is the next question. It said, hi Solid or any other person who can help. Do you guys reckon the Honda Rally 300 will do okay on the beach? Planning and buying one, beach riding is one of my bucket list things to do. Never had a dual sport, so I am unsure, thanks. Yeah, riding on the beach is its own beast. It is absolutely fantastic. If you've never done it, it is one of the most fun things you can do on a motorcycle or in fact with your pants on. I really love beach riding. It's just one of those bucket list things and I'm glad that it's on your list, mate. And I'm glad that you're looking at getting a dual sport. You definitely should. It's such a rewarding category of motorcycle. The rally will be absolutely fine in the sand. Now there are a few caveats to this. When you're riding deep sand, it is a little bit challenging if you're just getting into it and it looks like you are just getting into it. Don't let it overwhelm you. Expect to drop the bike a lot, but there's some important things to remember. The first thing is tire pressures. It's very important that you lower your tire pressures. If it's really, really deep sand, I would go as low as 10 PSI. Some people might say even lower. Some people might say a bit higher. Find your comfort zone, but you definitely will need to let some air out of your tires because that will help you get a lot more grip and stability in the sand. Now to do that at super low pressures, you will need what's called as rim lock. They're fairly cheap. You can get a pair for $30 to $60 Australian and get a tire shop to fit them up, no hassle at all. It just helps keep the tire stuck to the bike with those very low pressures. So those two things are really important if you're doing beach riding. The other thing I'd wanna be comfortable with before beach riding is that I can get my bike up without too much hassle when I drop it because that's something you're gonna do quite a lot in deep sand is you're gonna tip over because it is one of the more challenging terrains. So if all that's freaking you out a bit, don't let it because that's why sand is so rewarding. It's because it's challenging and especially on the beach, it's a lot of fun because it almost feels a little bit naughty like you're not supposed to be there. It's quite a weird thing riding next to the wide open ocean. I will put up some images of when I've ridden along the beach. It's definitely one of my top rides of all time. So welcome to the dirt, mate. The rally will be fine in the sand. Just watch a few videos on how to ride deep sand and you'll be all set and you'll have the time of your life. 
The next question is from Long Rider and he's saying, how did I come up with the channel name? Well, I really wish I had have put more thought into the channel name. It was just kind of on a whim. So I'm a bit of a nerd. I like reading fantasy and high fantasy books. And I was reading at the time, Stephen Donaldson's Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, The Unbeliever. And so that had got stuck in my head. Solid was always been around. It was just something that that's how my mates always sold me. I'm very stoic, I'm very solid. I'm always dependable and reliable and I'm very loyal. So solid was an easy fit for my name growing up as a teenager in high school. So the next comment is from AWOW and he's saying, hey mate, how you doing? What mount are you using for the Garmin? Well, I responded to you as well, but I thought this would be applicable to anyone watching. The RAM mount I use for my Garmin and for the Sony action camera facing me when I'm riding off-road, they're both RAM mounts. I just really like the RAM mounts because they're very durable. Uh, they have fittings for everything. And that's also what I'm using for my mirrors. I can always swap stuff around if God forbid one of them does break. I've never had a RAM mount break in the many years I've been riding. I really think they're quite dependent I do also have a phone mount. When I've got a road bike, I mount my phone on what's called a quad lock, as I do think that's a much better system for day to day keeping your phone on. The next comment is from long hair don't care. Well, I'm from the other tribe, mate. I've got no hair don't care. So anyway, now that you've had a bit of time with the 300L, what's your thoughts in comparison to the WR? I'm struggling to decide which route to go. I can get a WR already set up with 6K kilometers or a brand new 300L. This one is really difficult, mate, because it really is splitting hairs. I love them both, but that's probably a good indication. I already love the 300L as much, perhaps even a little bit more already than I do the WR250R. It's a, it's a really hard thing. I don't want to say one's better than the other because each does something better. The WR250R, like you said, you could get that thing kitted out with all the fruit and ride off into the sunset immediately, which is a big deal. You'll have to spend a lot of time getting the stuff bolted onto the Honda, which adds on to the cost. You'll probably also have a wait in waiting for it to get here as there is quite a delay in ordering these bikes. The other big thing I wanted to point out as well, there's no big tanks available for the 300L yet. So that is a big problem. If you're wanting to do big adventures, straight away. I have all faith that IMS and Safari will release something. This bike is too popular not to, but in the short term, you're gonna to have to do little jerry cans on the back like I do, but it's not perfect when you're carrying a whole pile of luggage. That said, I think if I had the choice, both bikes were brand new, released today, back to back, I would go with the Honda. The engine is just too good to pass up, in my opinion. Now, this is early days. Remember, I've got rose-colored glasses on as well. I've only had this, you know, four or five months now. It hasn't been that long, so I'm still feeling very good about the purchase. So keep that in the context, but it is a very good bike. Yes, the suspension isn't as good. Yes, it's a few kilos heavier. I can't really feel it. It really isn't that noticeable because I think the weight is carried a little lower in the 300. But when I say better, it is splitting hairs. They're both fantastic bikes, but I think it really does make a difference when you're out on the open road. This bike at 110 to 130 is, I can say, pretty much a pleasure to ride in the context of small dual sports. It is very, very good for a 286cc bike. It's not gonna blow your mind at those speeds, but it is comfortable. You don't really feel fatigued and the motor is more than capable of sitting at those speeds. The WR was so impressive because as a 250, it could do those speeds without being at the absolute edge like the 250L was or the KLX was. Gun to my head, I'm going with the 300. Sorry, WR 250R riders, but I am loving this bike so much. But like I said, if this broke down or got crushed tomorrow and someone gave me a 250R, I'd be quite happy. I hope that muddled non-answer answer helps you out somehow. So the next question is from Jonathan. How's the weight difference between the DRZ and the CRF? I'm assuming you mean the 400. I really can't notice it. Now I need to point out again, I rode the E model. It's the only model we get here in Australia. So the Australian E model weighs 138 kilograms which is six kilos or four kilos, some amount of kilos heavier than the 300L. The S model in America is in the 140, so it is about the same weight, maybe a little bit heavier than the 300L. So keep that in mind. If you're looking for an S, 
they're basically the same weight. The disparity is if you're looking at the E over the L. I really can't notice it to be honest. In fact, when I'm riding, the 300 actually feels lighter than the 400. I think that's because of suspension, the ground clearance is a lot taller on the 400E. So it feels a little top heavy, that's more of a tipping point on it, so it does feel a little heavier. When you're talking about small amounts of weight, and when it's concealed quite well, like the 300, it really is splitting hairs. I don't think it's much of an issue. And just in the saddle feeling, this actually feels a bit lighter. So the next question is what GPS am I running and do I like it? Thank you for asking this question because I've really been wanting to shout from the heavens about Garmin's new GPSs. I've upgraded from my old Garmin 78S to the Garmin 66i and I have been waiting for this kind of GPS for so goddamn long I can't explain how excited I am about this GPS. So it's basically the most value for money GPS that Garmin make, I think, for motorcycle riders. You do get a smaller screen, I'm fine with that. My eyes are good. It's bigger than the screen on my 78S. It still has analog buttons, which I think is very important when you have gloves on it. And I just can't bring myself to pay the money for a Montana or an Oregon, something fancy like that. But the i series of all those bring together the SOS function. So they have the EPIRB, that is, you hit the button and it contacts the satellite and sends emergency services for you inbuilt into the GPS. And on top of that, you can text through the GPS or connect via Bluetooth with your phone. So you can text the emergency services or you can text family members or friends if you need help straight away. So the fact that they've merged that into one device just makes it fantastic because I don't have to charge two devices on an adventure. I don't have to worry about two devices on an adventure. I don't have to worry about carrying two devices. So the weight savings there. The drawback of course is with these GPSs is you are amalgamating your SOS device with your GPS. Now, why is that a problem? Well, if you crash your bike and your bike careers off 100 meters down the road in a separate way to you and you end in a ditch horribly broken and you can't make it back to your bike and you need to hit the SOS button, well, you've got a bit of a problem, don't you? So that does worry me, but I generally don't ride by myself. And if I do ride by myself, it's never remotely and never in any kind of serious off-road riding. So that's how I mitigate that problem. But it is a problem I wanted to point out, but it's one I'm willing to live with for the simplicity and how streamlined it is to have a GPS and an SOS device in one thing. So that's my big gushing report of the Garmin's GPS Maps 66i. The final question is from Gorach. I think that's how you pronounce your name. Man, these videos are just me butchering everyone's names. Maybe that's what you're all coming here for. Anyway, if you're going for a long trip, one to four weeks, in gravel, highway, city, a little off-road, is a small, lightweight, five to 650cc bike the best option? Or would a light bike be horrible on the highway? You're probably talking to the wrong person, mate. I've done multi-day trips on highways on 250s. Now, five to 650cc motorcycle in my books is a middleweight, not a small light bike. I think in that cc range, you've got more than enough weight in the bike to be quite stable out on the open highway. I'm thinking of bikes like the CB500X, the V-Strom 650, KLR 650, the DR 650. All those bikes are 150 kilos plus, and they're not really going to get battered around in the wind too much. That size bike is great for doing a little bit of everything. So I think you've identified the right category. They'll be fantastic on the highway. DR650 will probably be the least good, but all the twin adventure bikes that are that size will be fantastic on the highway. Still do a little bit of dirt and you'll be very, very comfortable. Anyway, guys, that's enough ranting for me. Don't forget to stay shiny side up and I'll catch you in the next video. See you later.